Hello, and welcome to The Cup That Cheers. If you're new to this channel, welcome. I'm Elizabeth, and today we're talking about what non-military people wore in California between the 1760s and 1800, when the state was one of the Kingdom of Spain's colonies. Research is ongoing, and the information and images presented in this lecture represent a fraction of what is known to be available, and an even smaller fraction of what may exist unknown to researchers in dusty attics, travel trunks, and private homes. The views expressed in this lecture are my own. The results of my research and experience as an independent scholar, costume historian, dressmaker, and historical reenactor, and they are often in good faith. Let's get started. As the old rhyme states, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. While it is no longer agreed that this voyage ended with the earliest discovery of the Americas, it can be said that the events that immediately followed the landing of Columbus's ships on the Caribbean island of Hispaniola set off a further chain of events that changed the American continents forever. Because Columbus was employed by the Spanish crown, his expedition led, led to Spain's claim to the right of conquest over most of the Americas, a claim which lasted over 300 years. 200 years after Columbus's arrival, Spanish rule had been firmly established in most of Mexico, Central, and South America, with the rest of North America left unoccupied as a sort of no man's land between the territories claimed by the British, the Russians, and the French. The aforementioned countries expanding their exploration of the Americas and Asia in the early and mid 18th century, and the need for Pacific coastal resupply stations for the Spanish galleons on their way back from trade in Asia, were the main reasons for the settlement of California, which began in the 1760s. Since California was one of the last parts of the Spanish Empire to be settled, it was badly supplied and far away from the cultural and political movements that were current in Spain and the more established parts of Spanish America. This distance affected everything, from the architecture and economy to the traje, or dress. Unfortunately, because a relatively small number of people thought California a suitable subject for visual art, like sketches and paintings, we have nowhere near the number of locally made, accurate images of her native residents as we do of the inhabitants of the rest of the Americas at the same time. English and other publications depicted Native Americans as fantastical beings somewhere between the native people of the Caribbean and the Aztecs of central Mexico, and fed the lingering tales of mythical exotic cities paved with gold and precious gems which were said to exist in California. In 1762, Father Ignacio Tirsch visited Baja California and in the following years also traveled to Monterey in Alta California, present day state of California, sketching some of the people, places, animals, and veg vegetation he saw, including some of the native people groups. His sketches, while begun in California and probably finished back in Europe, are just about the earliest and most accurate images of native Californians, as well as of the early settlers. Father Tiersch showed native people in their everyday attire, mostly naked, except for bead jewelry and feather ornaments. Generally, the men and children are shown completely naked, the women wearing skirts made of grasses or leaves, with the addition of animal skin capes, probably for cold weather. In 1786, French explorer La Perouse visited California and made several sketches of the native Californians and colonists whom he saw, and these are probably the earliest accurate depictions of Northern California native dress. In 1791, the Spanish explorers with the Malaspina scientific expedition stopped at Monterey and created the next earliest group of illustrations of the lo local native peoples and the missionaries. In this image, we see a native California man who is wearing a breech cloth and carrying some weapons, possibly provided by the mission, although they're equally possibly his own possessions. Native men, women, and children who lived at the missions were given a woolen hip length shirt and blanket every year. Men and boys also received a breech cloth and women and girls also received a petticoat. 
It appears that they continued to wear as little as possible during the warm months of the year, as letters and documents left by the Mission Padres contained complaints that the people continued in their nakedness. As the years went by, however, succeeding generations of Mission residents grew accustomed to wearing more clothing, and extra clothing was given as a reward for good work and mastery of Spanish cultural components like language. In an article published in 1892, Guadalupe Vallejo, the daughter or granddaughter of original colonists, recalled that, quote, in 1776, the regular five years supplies sent from Mexico to the missions included 107 blankets, 480 yards striped sackcloth, 389 yards blue bays, 10 pounds blue maguey cloth. The missions, as fast as possible, provided the native Californians with blankets, which were woven under the father's personal supervision for home use and for sale. They were also taught to weave a coarse serge for clothing. It was between 1792 and 1795 that the governor brought a number of artisans from Mexico, and every mission wanted them, but there were not enough to go around. There were masons, millwrights, tanners, shoemakers, saddlers, potters, a ribbon maker, and several weavers. The blankets and the coarse cloth I have spoken of were first woven in the southern missions, San Gabriel, San Juan Capistrano, and others. About 1797, cotton cloth was also made in a few cases, and the cotton plant was found to grow very well. Hemp was woven at Monterey. The women were kept busy at various occupations. They were taught spinning, knitting, the weaving of Indian baskets from grasses, willow rods and roots, and more especially, plain sewing." Unquote. Here we see a sketch of Mission Carmel with the natives and the Padres meeting with the La Perouse exp expedition in 1786. The Frenchmen in their recognizably European clothing are distinct from the long row of native people dressed mostly in breech cloths. In this detail from a sketch of Carmel Mission Plaza in 1791 by Jose Cordero, one of the artists who accompanied the Malaspina expedition, we see a bit more clothing on the native people, including what looks like a cloth blanket or cape, perhaps made from mission wool fabric, worn with a grass or feather skirt or apron on the women in the foreground. The native peoples are otherwise naked above the waist, some which with breech cloths, while at least one man appears completely naked, showing that this is still the norm more than 10 years after Spanish settlement. Here's some more illustrations from Father Ignacio Tirsch's time in California. These illustrations are probably of neophytes at a mission in Baja, California, but early 19th century mission residents in Alta, California, as well as some of the colonists, dressed similarly although these women aren't wearing the rebosos that became so iconic in California. The women are wearing Spanish-style gathered chemises and full petticoats with plain aprons and shoes. The only part of the man's clothing that is visible is the neckline of his blue shirt, but we can see that it is not European in style with gathered fullness or pleats at the neckline and a collar. The Spanish citizens who colonized California, called Californios, were working class people, most of mixed race. Many of the men were soldiers in the army who were paid not so much in money as in supplies for establishing a new home in a new land and the promise of land ownership after 10 years of service. The first party of soldiers and priests left Northern Mexico in 1769, led by, led by Gaspar de Portola and Father Junipero Serra. A second party of soldiers and settlers, led by Juan Bautista de Anza, traveled between 1775 and 1776. Anza's supply list includes these items, wardrobe for a man, three shirts of good Silesian linen, three pairs of underdrawers of Puebla cloth, two cloth coats with lining and trimmings, two pairs of breeches with lining and trimmings, two pairs of stockings, two pairs of chamois skin boots, three pairs of gaiter shoes, one cloth cape lined with thick flannel, one hat, one ribbon for the hat and hair. Anza's wardrobe for a woman consisted of 
three shirts, three pairs of white Puebla petticoats, two pairs of petticoats, silk serge and thick flannel, and an underskirt, linen cloth for jackets, two pairs of Brussels stockings, two pairs of hose, two pairs of shoes, two shawls, one hat, six varas of ribbon. Children's clothing supplies included Puebla cloth for linings, petticoats, and white trousers, thick flannel, linen for shirts, other unidentified cloth, hats, shoes, shawls, and ribbons. Puebla cloth was a tightly woven wool or cotton fabric made in Puebla, Mexico, and could be purchased both in a natural white or tan or dyed a cochineal red or indigo blue color as cochineal and indigo were both grown or produced in northern Mexico. When the settlers arrived in San Diego, this supply of clothing, which they had received at the beginning of their journey, was so worn out and tattered that they could not keep themselves decently clothed, and they were resupplied at the mission. This state of near poverty remained the rule during the first several years of Spanish settlement in California. Apart from the governor and his family, who resided, resided at Monterey, the capital, and perhaps the commander of each of the army presidios, there were no wealthy people importing European fashions and commissioning portraits of themselves and their neighbors in California during the 18th century. While we have the above descriptions of the clothes, there are no complete garments remaining from this time period in California that can be studied so quite a bit of extrapolation is necessary in order to learn what the garments looked like. It can be assumed that the people would have made their clothes according to the pattern used by the lower and middle classes of northern Mexico in the late 1770s. Standard 18th century European patterns for generic working class shifts, petticoats, breeches, and shirts, as well as men's and women's simple jackets, can be adapted to match the available illustrations. The only exceptions to this are women's stays and caps. Historian David Rickman says that there is no indication that boned stays or corsets, as they were known in Europe, were available in California until just before the gold rush, and none of the period images show California women wearing caps. The silhouette of the women's bodices in Ignacio Tiersch's illustrations, however, indicates that some kind of stiffening must have been present in the bodices themselves. Apart from the sketches that have already been shown, the most helpful source of detailed illustrations is a genre of portraiture called casta paintings. Casta, or cast paintings, were a uniquely Spanish and Portuguese art form combining the Enlightenment's obsession with categorization and the Iberian people's experience with racial, religious, and cultural identification and legal segregation through centuries of Moorish and then Christian rule. Each scene shows a man, a woman, and child in quote-unquote typical costume and settings, illustrating the major quote-unquote pure blood costas, Spanish, Indian, and African or Moorish, which can also mean Middle Eastern, and the costa which results when people of these races have children together, and then each further costa when mixed race people have children with someone in one of the other costas. In most of the Spanish Empire, the costa a person belonged to also determined the legal, financial, and social status and to some extent, the clothing of the individual. However, in California, the cost of designations were not so strictly uh, applied. And as long as you were moderately prosperous and lived as a Spaniard, i.e. according to Spanish culture, you could own property and have the same social status and dress as other citizens who owned the same amount of property, no matter what your racial background was. So, in analyzing the images of 18th century California women, these are the common clothing elements. White linen camisa, or shirt or chemise, with medium to high neckline with no visible cleavage, usually edged with a gathered ruffle, with full elbow length sleeves, also usually edged with a gathered ruffle that shows under the jacket sleeves, a fitted wool or linen cuerpo, 
or kasaka, which means a bodice or jacket, with medium high round or square neckline, also no visible cleavage, waist pointed at center front, stiffened with light boning and or cording in the front and at body seams, with elbow legs length sleeves with a slightly longer ruffle compared to the ruffle on the camisa sleeves, hip length peplum or skirt attached to the back and sides of the bodice at the waist, laced over a dark or contrasting stomacher, or laced or possibly hook and eye fastened closed edge to edge at center front. Two non-ruffled ankle length faldas or naguas, which is the Spanish words for skirts or petticoats, in solid colors. Wealthier women are shown in cotton print petticoats, but the solid, solid colors include red, often with a white cotton or linen yoke from the waist to the hips, and red wool or other color from there to the hem. Black or white cotton or wool stockings and plain brown or black leather shoes with low heels. Solid colored or white or striped cotton or linen reboso, which is a rectangular cloth veil covering the head and wrapped around the shoulders and neck instead of a cap. And a hat only when on horseback. Hair was probably braided and either left hanging or round, wound around the head, perhaps like 16th century hair taping, under the reboso. Accessories include a white or colored apron with rounded bottom edges, edged with white self-fabric bias ruffle, or no ruffle at all. Maybe a crucifix on a black ribbon around the neck, or a coral bead necklace. 18th century California man's clothing includes white linen or cotton camisa or shirt with no ruffles except maybe for the governor, and calzoncillos, which are loose drawers as underclothes, dark wool velvet or broadcloth calzones or breeches that have functional buttons at the side seam from the hips down and buckled or buttoned at the knee, a dark wool skirted abrigo or jacket with long sleeves and brass or other metal buttons to fasten at center front, a colorful striped fringed wool serape, either draped over one shoulder or with a hole in the middle for the head, worn with the ends either hanging down front and back or with one end hanging down the back with the front piece swung across the body and over one shoulder. White, black, or natural wool or cotton stockings and brown or black leather shoes. Wide red wool, silk or cotton faja or sash around the waist with a clean shaven face, hair shoulder length or perhaps longer, but slicked back from the face and tied into a queue, with a wide brimmed wool felt sombrero or hat held on with a leather chin strap. Military men, of course, wore their army issued uniform, uniforms of blue and red wool with a cuero or thick leather jacket or tunic on top. And that takes us to the end of the 18th century when major changes were about to take place in California's population, culture, and politics. Watch the second half of this lecture, Clothing the California in the 19th Century, to see and hear what those changes meant for the way people dressed in California. Please remember to give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you like the content. Adios!